Good evening, friends. My name is Margaret Rawls. I work in the programs department at Washington National Cathedral. If you're just hearing my voice right now, you're in the right spot. There should be a purple slide on your screen with the title of tonight's program and our guest. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but I wanted to go over a couple technical things. If you have any questions about sound you can't hear or you can't see throughout the evening, feel free to add the ask those in the chat function. That's the little speech bubble on the bottom of your screen on the icon bar. We'll be chatting throughout the evening on that too. So if you've got thoughts or you really responded to a quote, feel free to add that there. It's a great community. If you have any questions for our panelists, Bishop Robinson, Canon Duncan, Charlotte Clymer, please feel free to use that Q&A function. As those are the two speech bubbles on the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions there. You can also upvote other attendees' questions and comment, comment on them. The ones that have the most votes will work really hard to make sure that they get to our panelists. We're going to begin in just a moment. Thank you for joining us. All right, we are almost all here. Here we go. Welcome, friends. So, um, my name is Michelle Dibley. I'm the can. Uh, the I, I am the program director here at Washington National Cathedral. I am not a canon. That honor belongs to a canon Rosemary Logan Duncan, who is with us. Uh, Bishop Jean Robinson is also with us, and uh, Charlotte Clymer is also with us. I'll say a few more words of introduction in just a second. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining us for this film conversation on this extraordinary film that has been created and that is so timely for this moment. And we are, we hope that you have watched it. We certainly sent you the invitation. I think that we'll have a, a lively and wonderful discussion, even if you have not, and perhaps you uh, will take the opportunity to uh, see the film online and uh, tell others about it. So it's a really extraordinary thing. And so we'll hear more about um, Bishop Robinson's participation in the film and uh, also the reflections from others who are with us. So, um, Canon Duncan, would you open us with a prayer, please? Oh, you're muted. Okay. Almighty God who breathes life into each one of us and all of creation. We pray for the human family, giving thanks for the diversity of your creation. Help us to embrace people of all sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions as your children. May we do this in love with compassion and celebration. Be with us this evening in our words, in our conversation, that guided by the Holy Spirit, we may live together in your peace. In your holy name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you. So a few words of introduction before we begin our conversation about the film. Um, Bishop Jean Robinson uh, is a, a beloved activist in a, the arena of human rights, much beyond the LGBTQ sphere. He was ordained in 2003 as a, a bishop, the first in the Episcopal Church and in mainline churches to be uh, openly gay and consecrated as a bishop um, for the Diocese of New Hampshire. Um, part of my story is that I was living nearby and able to be present at the consecration, which was a really joyful, extraordinary experience that I, I carry with me. Um, we have most recently had the, the, the honor and the privilege of welcoming Bishop Robinson to the National Cathedral for the interment of Matthew Shepard's ashes, as well as a celebration of his birthday that happened the week, the year later on the anniversary. So we look forward to um, continuing to honor Matt and his legacy and uh, Bishop Robinson is a, a part of that, certainly. Um, Canon uh, Rose Duncan is the Canon for Worship here at Washington National Cathedral. She is a triple Howard grad. 
spent a time in the mental health field before her ordination in 2006. And I think she may talk a little bit about what it was like to be uh, in the process of ordination as an uh, openly uh, out lesbian during the time when Bishop Robinson was going through the consecration process as well. So we are lucky to have Canon Duncan with us. And then Charlotte Clymer is uh, with us as well. Charlotte is a, a member of St. Mark's Episcopal on Capitol Hill. So we are a, a proud house of Episcopalians tonight. Charlotte is also an activist, writer, journalist, uh, many, many, many things um, that Charlotte brings into the world. You may know her on Twitter as, is it CM Clymer? Is that right? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so if you don't follow Charlotte on Twitter, I would highly recommend it. Um, and then, and Charlotte also serves on a number of boards and I'm going to name this part. She's a 2019 40 under 40 queer woman of DC honoree, which I think sounds very cool as a proud DC resident. So, so that's who's with us tonight. We're going to spend time in conversation for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, our folks behind the scenes are gathering all of your questions. So please put those into the Q and A or the chat so that we can get to them. Um, probably about 8.30, 8.40 or so and bring you all into the conversation. So, so Bishop, I would love to start with you and hear your reflections on the, the making of this film, your participation in it, this moment. Um, open, uh, open the floor to wherever you want to start with us tonight. Great. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm so honored to be here with uh, Charlotte and Rose and all of you, really. Um, and I'm coming to you live from the Chautauqua Institution in far western New York, where I serve as the vice president of religion. Um, um, I want to talk more about the filmmaker than the film, because um, if you've ever been involved in one of these projects, you know it's the filmmaker that makes or breaks uh, a documentary like this. And um, I know this quite well because I was in uh, Dan's first uh, film for The Bible Tells Me So. And in it, of course, as you see in this film, uh, Dan uh, interviewed my parents. And what I can tell you is that uh, Dan has this way of getting people to trust him. And uh, it's just astounding to me what he can get people to say about themselves. I literally heard my parents saying things I had never heard them say, ever, ever, ever. I was stunned. So what you, what you see in these interviews is someone who is so people oriented and so committed to this work and to this, this particular issue that uh, people find themselves just um, uh, going on this journey with him and, and, and telling him and therefore us uh, exactly what it felt like. Um, and and uh, as, as, so making this kind of uh, documentary is not just about you know doing the right editing and all of that sort of thing. It it is about um, creating a safe space where people can actually tell their truth. And then yes, you edit it and, and put it into a lovely form. But if you don't have the if you don't have the words from people's hearts, uh, if they're not genuinely talking to you, you don't have much of a film. And, and that's why this is so powerful uh, and so moving. In particular, I mean, and you have to know that Dan doesn't know any of these people before he starts. Th these are not just acquaintances. Um, you know, he was, he was abs absolutely committed in this uh, film to uh, make sure that, that uh, transgender people were uh, a, a major focus and that he had people of color and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, so he is starting literally from scratch, relationship-wise, with all of these people. So it's a it's an extraordinary experience to be a part of. I knew um, Sarah um, uh, McBride in uh, because I was working with her as a colleague uh, at the Center for American Progress, and um, and so I had told Dan about her, uh, but he had never met her before. Um, I, I want to just say one one more thing about um, this film and 
uh, Dan's former film, about what's actually happening here. A lot of people think that the most important um, uh, uh, Bible uh, uh, quotation uh, is, you know, maybe from Leviticus about it being an abomination or it's a Sodom and Gomorrah or, you know, whatever. Uh, I have come to believe that this is the most important uh, scripture to focus on. And I think this is what this film does. So in John's gospel, which is mostly the uh, Jesus's conversation with the disciples uh, at the Last Supper, uh, John tells us in, uh, in the 16th chapter, Jesus says the following. He says, there is much that I would teach you, but you cannot understand it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. These films posit the question, could it be God working through gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender people, queer people, um, all, all of the letters, you know? Could it be that it's God working through uh, all of us to, to bring us to truth, right? I mean, does anybody doubt that it was the Holy Spirit uh, uh, working to end slavery, right? Um, it, the Holy Spirit has led us into all kinds of truth. Why wouldn't God lead us into truth about human sexuality? And, and uh, I think in this film, I think I say, you know, these two little boxes labeled male and female, just they don't cut it anymore it, because they are not sufficient for the kind of diversity we know that exists among us. So I think that the power of these films is that it uses family, you know, most whether you've got a good one or a bad one, you can kind of relate to it. And it uses the family to pose this question um, in a very non-threatening way. Like, could it be that we got this wrong? And, and could it be the Holy Spirit that's leading us into a deeper, further truth that until now, we, we just couldn't handle it. So um, uh, I'm, I'm committed to this film and, and its predecessor uh, because I have seen it change lives. And I have had um, people say to me, that little film where the Bible tells me so, it saved my relationship with my family. Uh, uh, because it made a relationship possible again. So I think in any way that we can do that, raise that, and, and I like to pose that question and not answer it. Just like, l let, let it sit with people, the notion that God might be behind the discomfort you're feeling. Thank you. And then, and then just let it percolate. The spirit does wonders when things are percolating mm -hmm. <laughs> and we give them room to do that. So thank you. I wanna come back to a couple of things you've said in, the, in some of the larger conversation. And I'll turn now to Rose Duncan to uh, share a little bit about your own reflections about the church and the film and, and this journey that the institution has been on. Well, so much of the film, just, her, just really exposing the lives of these families and the struggles that they've had um, and I was really taken so much by the parents in their journey. Um, it's not just those of us who are going through the process of our own coming out and our own ability to, to love ourselves and to realize our worth, but it's the struggle that our parents have so often. And it was so revealed here with such vulnerability and intimacy. And that's what struck me throughout, throughout the, the film because these parents were coming from their very core beliefs, the things that had made them who they are and their worldviews. And suddenly all of that foundation for them had been shaken. And personally, it resonated so much with some of my own experience, um, particularly with my mother. My father died uh, when I was 24, before we, we got into these conversations. I'm sure he knew, but it was my mother's struggle and that's what I could see in some of, of some of the parents. The, the, 
really it's it's the um not the fantasies but all of the hopes and dreams that they had in mind for their children and the fact that they are now fearful fearful for their lives fearful for their happiness and all of that just came through so very strongly and it's something that my mother struggled with because the dream she had for me they weren't fitting in the box that I was evolving as a person that, that would work out. And so these families, in the pain of it, the fear of it, at the bottom, I could still see they love their children. They really love their children and they wanted the best for them. But it was the fear that they had, even the sense of they'll be embarrassed if their friends knew. They would be somehow thinking, what have I done wrong that I raised a child like this? And so all of those things were so revealed. And I think for, for those of us who've ever gone through the coming out process, however long it may have taken, we know that if our parents were alive, they were struggling with these things too. And for those of us who grew up in the church and you, you find these families who are rooted in the church, um, that struggle was very present um, for me even because I had to, I, I struggled with it because there were all these folks who were saying, well, this is just horrible. You're an abomination. And as a teenager, I went out just like the other folks. I went to the library to read all I could read, um, just, just to figure it out. Um, but the, the struggle with it, and then finally, it was really returning to scripture that gave me the answer. And it's in Romans 8, and I happen to have been reading it at a funeral, that nothing, absolutely nothing could ever separate me from the love of God and Jesus Christ. And that, had, that was a pivotal moment at age 20 that took away so much of my own um, fear and concern about my relationship with God, because I realized in that moment, and it was a, a moment of death for someone else that became a moment of life for me. So just a few, pieces there. <laughs> a few very powerful pieces, a few really powerful pieces. And you named the tenderness that is at the, in those relationships that is the more tender because of the pain that is in the vulnerability, right? And we spend so much time trying to protect ourselves so that we don't have to, to offer that vulnerability up, that tenderness up, because it, it, if somebody pokes at it, it hurts, right? So it's, um, thank you for, it, for naming that and, that and your own experience and observing that as well. So, Charlotte, I'd love to turn to you next for some reflections about the film and uh, what it meant to you as you were watching it. And I understand you also know Sarah, so there may have been some other, some personal reflections that you had as well in, in your experience of the, the, watching the film. Absolutely. Well, uh, it's such an honor tonight to join uh, Bishop Robinson and Reverend Ken Duncan. And I wanted to thank you, Michelle, and the team at Washington National Cathedral for, for putting this together. It's uh, it's critical, especially in this moment with so many attacks on LGBTQ people from our own federal government. And at a time in our history when LGBTQ people in general just feel um, vulnerable and, and not safe. And so it's it's very important right now. Um, I love the film and it was already very well said, uh, what was said before, but I, I wanted to point out how much I appreciated the resistance of villainizing anyone in the film. I feel, I feel like so often LGBTQ families and stories and narratives have a hero and a villain. And so often that keeps us from meeting people where they are and understanding that often, you know, bigotry comes from a place of pain, significant pain or misunderstanding or ignorance. And it's so important that we recognize good faith where it exists, because if we're not, you know, being comfortable and open to the, the good faith and the good intentions of people, even if they're wrong in their views, we're not making progress in that way. Um, the, the one family that just stood out to me so much were um, the devoutly religious evangelical parents who, you know, you could see in their hearts they wanted to do a lot of good, 
um, and they were struggling with what that looked like. Like, how is that supposed to form? Um, and they surely made some mistakes, but I mean, just you could see the pain in their eyes from watching everything that unfolded before them and not knowing what to do next and, and being told that all they had to do was pray to God for it to be solved. Uh, not really recognizing uh, that, you know, the answers were right there in front of them, which is just to love, right? Um, Sarah McBride is a, a close and dear friend of mine. She's basically a sister and I would say something of a mentor, even though she's a little younger than me. Um, I was in the closet for years and years after Sarah came out. And I uh, had told her years before I came out the struggle I was going through. And, you know, it really, something she told me really stuck with me. She said, you have to come out on your own timeline. You can't do it on anyone else's. You can't be forced to come out. You uh, can't be forced to, you know, be someone on the terms of other people. And I think that applies to families as well. Um, you know, the, the way that, uh, you know, families are so different from each other and, and there are cultural implications at play. There's, um, there are other socio, uh, sociological factors, uh, you know, race, disability, um, you know, uh, uh, folks who are religious minorities, uh, financial situations. There are so many other factors at play and it, it's really critically uh, important to recognize that not everyone has the same story in their journey and not every family has the same story. And so I greatly appreciated the film sought to illuminate that we're all different from each other in the broader LGBTQ family and to recognize that and respect it. Thank you. It, this is a great segue into one of, for me, one of the questions for the, um, about the film. It does such an extraordinary job of the describing the pastoral response that is possible when we can listen, right? When we can, uh, can show up and support one another. And, and that has to be the beginning of any of those relationships. And the film also touches on the, the political backlash that's happening, right? That a significant part of what's happening, and Charlotte, you mentioned the, the fear that many people are living in right now, um, is that there is this very public animosity that is provoked in, in some cases by the, by the kinds of churches that some of these folks attended, right? And so how, the question that I wanna pose is how do we respond if the intent is to not villainize anyone, how do we respond in the face of legislative campaigns or electoral campaigns that seek to provoke this kind of, um, uh, this kind of, some would say hatred, but some also would say villainizing people who don't deserve to be villains, right? How do we respond? And I'll actually leave that open because I think there's probably a variety of responses. I can also pick somebody. Oh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny. There is the legal battle and the cultural battle uh, mm -hmm. to every civil rights movement. Um, every single one, women's rights, the, 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 the big civil rights movement, LGBTQ rights, uh, the rights for disabled folks, every single one. The legal battle is actually far more simpler, right? You get a law passed, you go through the court system, uh, it's codified, it's put on paper, and you're good to go. The cultural battle is the one that's really, really hard and entrenched and takes a long time. Uh, and so that's that's there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that the easy part for us is to register to vote, to vote for pro-equality candidates, uh, to demand legislation that protects all people, uh, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, and to uh, demand laws in place um, that ensure the public square is open and accessible to all. That's the easy part. The hard part is fostering, creating communities that are culturally welcoming. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking, of, I keep thinking of something that happened a couple nights ago. I was talking to Chastin Buttigieg, who is a friend of mine, and he is the husband of Mayor P. Buttigieg, who ran for president. And there was a lot of criticism of the idea that Mayor P. Buttigieg didn't represent all LGBTQ people, which is true. As a white gay man, he does not represent all LGBTQ people. What's false, however, is that LGBTQ people, anyone in the LGBTQ community is immune from discrimination. 
because Chas and Buddha Judge and Pete Buddha Judge, they went back to Indiana where they went back to their house and they had our pride flag out front. And he told me that a few nights ago he was uh, sitting on his porch and some truck drove by and they just screamed some homophobic slurs as they drove by at the house. You know, no one is immune from this. That's the cultural battle. And that's what we really need to keep in mind. I would Thank also you. say that, you know, um, again, the legislative is so important. Um, the laws are, are, are there um, with the potential to protect. But so much is about the changing of hearts. It's so much about the changing of hearts and for people to realize that they have gay, lesbian, trans, a queer, all of us, there's someone in your orbit, whether you know it or not, and it's how that relationship plays out. So it's no longer this group of people who are over there, but it's this person that I'm personally in a relationship with that changes the heart. And it's the same thing that Martin Luther King was trying to say the same thing, you know, with, with, with race. You know, we look at our circles and you figure out in the, in the LGBTQIA plus community, um, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. And it's really those relationships one-on-one -on -one where you see me as a person and not just as a category or a label. Um, that's the thing that's gonna to help to change hearts and to change lives as we have those relationships one with another. I, I wanna underscore something um, that Charlotte said. Uh, well, and, and actually uh, Rose as well. So just because uh, we got the Jim Crow laws off the books didn't mean racism went away, right? Um, um, in case you haven't noticed. And uh, uh, I think it is, it is so easy to think that the legislation will take care of it, will take care of the cultural piece that Charlotte mentions. Uh, and it's just not true. Um, it's harder, it takes longer, it takes more courage. And, um, and it doesn't happen overnight. And, and uh, the thing that, that frightens me in our movement, um, the LGBTQ movement, is that for, for, for those of us who live on one of the coasts or in a big city bubble somewhere, when we got marriage equality, we were kind of, you know, set. And the reasonably wealthy white gay men um, arguing about where to have brunch on Sunday uh, thought we were done. <laughs> when in fact, we have 29 states where there were no protections whatsoever for us. And we just, just eked out one of them, right? With the Supreme Court uh, recently. But um, uh, uh, we've got a long way to go. And, and those who funded our movement and those who, who were in the streets for our movement cannot give up now because uh, that cultural piece has not happened yet. And it certainly has not happened in, um, in the non-urban areas. And, and as, as uh, Charles says, I mean, it, even in the urban areas, you'll, you'll, find, um, uh, you'll find hate, but especially in, in uh, and more rural parts of America, I think, um, uh, from which I come, you know, rural Kentucky. Um, it, it's just a different, it's just a different picture. And we just dare not uh, forget that. You know, I, I worked on the marriage campaign in Minnesota in 2011 and 2012. And we had a successful vote in November to uh, um, not affirm same-sex marriage, but to uh, ensure that we didn't in prevent same-sex marriage. And then went the next legislative session and the legislature affirmed same-sex marriage. And, it, and right after that, I was working for the equity organization out front Minnesota at the time. We moved into a campaign around safe schools and we had a multiracial coalition of queer kids, of racial justice organizations. And it was the beautiful array of young people who knew that they were all in it together when we brought them all to the Capitol. They all talked to their legislators. And the bravest kids were the ones from greater Minnesota. The bravest kids were the ones who were wearing their non-conforming gender identity out in public, in their schools, and in that fight because they knew that 
first of all, they didn't care about getting married, but they knew that when they showed up at school, they weren't safe. They weren't welcomed. There were a few teachers who might be able to do that, but in general, in their communities, um, they, they didn't have the option to show up without worrying for their safety or worrying about whether they were going to be connected. And, and those are the, those are the kids that I, I, I mean, they're not kids anymore. And that was 2012, they're all in college or post-college now, I'm sure. And it, and it was the cultural battle that they were fighting for to be welcome and to thrive was really, it was extraordinary. And the parents and the adults who supported them is this, they're all in this mix. Um, so I, I resonate with the, the notion that there were a bunch of folks who thought we were done. Funding fell off too. So anybody who's listening who was part of supporting marriage, our organization had to slash staff because the people who thought we were in for marriage were in and then things had moved on. And so I wanna actually touch quickly on what are the organizations that are supporting, and these, these young people are referenced in the film too, right? The young people who are on the streets, who have left their families, who are in urban areas because they think it might be safer, right? What are the places, at least in the DMV area, where those of us who want to provide support to young people who are seeking it, who are uh, um, not, who don't have a safe place to be, or who are uh, looking for additional support. Where do we go? I know a couple organizations locally, but would love to hear um, you all share some of those ideas. So I if smile, I, I think smile in our, in our area. Yeah, say, can you say a little bit more about- smile. Um, It's really yeah. taking in um, younger people to help mm -hmm. them move through the process of, their, of, of claiming them, themselves, their own identities and sexualities. Mm -hmm. And I wish they had been a smile um, in existence when I was coming up as a yeah. teenager uh, because of the support that really wraps, that wraps around them so mm -hmm. that they're, they're able to move through really difficult times when they may be put out of their home. They find support in training. Just, it's just a wonderful organization that is, is started locally for us that's, that's something we should really look to support. Um, because um, as, as Jean was mentioning, we got really comfortable. And I think that's the same thing that happened within the church because you know um, integrity was really strong at, at one point. And you found even in churches, the, the, um, the groups that were supportive of gay, lesbian, trans issues, all those things, all of us had our little groups and our social things. But then something happened, particularly with, with marriage rights. It's like, well, all the fighting we had to do, well, we've kind of won and we can kind of sit back a little bit. And what we're seeing now is that that's not the case. That's not the case. And so, so many of the, the really tightly held organizations or fellowships that people had even in, in their individual churches, you start to see them fall away and not have kind of the structure or the goal um, of staying together. And so what I've said to, to folks in parishes where I've been is that we need to keep being forward, saying who we are and claiming that because the younger people behind us need to see that. They need to know that we are there and that we, we are also struggling with them. Mm -hmm. I was gonna point out uh, one of the, you know, most effective organizations in the area is Casa Ruby. That's uh, fun, I was gonna say, yes indeed, go ahead, <laughs> preach it. Yes, yes. Uh, Casa Ruby uh, uh, welcomes all LGBTQ people, uh, but they are, you know, especially a safe haven for trans non-binary uh, young people of color, uh, especially folks who are undocumented. Um, and, you know, just the work they do in, you know, uh, uh, taking uh, uh, especially LGBTQ homeless youth and trans youth off the streets, uh, for advocating for uh, trans non-binary sex workers, especially those of color in the area, uh, of really uh, being out front demanding uh, jobs programs from the DC City Council for uh, LGBTQ, especially trans folks of color. Uh, their their uh, work is incredible. And I'm gonna type their URL here in the message box, but I would highly recommend them. And uh, you know, Bishop, if you wanna say some more words on them, I'd love it. Well, I, I just, uh... I, I so respect uh, the work that they do. I mean, they are so kind of, uh, they know whereof they speak. Uh, they're led by someone who came to DC as a, you know, a homeless transgender person of color. And, uh, and she is a force to be reckoned with. I, I, I adore her. 
uh, and I always learn something from her uh, when I when I listen. And uh, uh, I I think for us as uh, even for us as I mean, it's amazing to me how ignorant about transgender people are. Uh, how ignorant gay and lesbian people can be about transgender people, right? Just because the letters get said together doesn't mean, you know, people know um, all about that, right? I, I mean, I've just been shocked um, at the level of, of, um, uh, of, of misinformation and so on. And, uh, and so uh, getting involved with something like uh, Casa Ruby or frankly, Smile, because most of the Smile kids these days are, are transgender kids of color. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's where our movement is right now, right? And so we, we really need to stay involved. Um, and the best thing to do is not to assume you know what would be helpful to these groups, but ask them what would be helpful and then believe them when they tell you, <laughs> right? I know it's always like when all else fails, just ask. Yeah. And um, I guess that's the other thing I would say about the transgender community that has been so humbling for me which is, as I've learned about that experience, as much as, as a, a, a cisgender man, a white man can do, um, uh, the, the transgender community's patience with us is astounding. And, and, the, and generally speaking, I've never been treated so graciously um, by people who just appreciate the fact that you're asking. You know, um, it, uh, this is not rocket science. It's like being human to one another um, and uh, respecting the dignity of every human being, right? I mean, we, we know this stuff. It's, it's just the living out of it that's uh, sometimes challenging. And we learn more and more and more about how to live it. The more we listen, the more we ask, the more we step into that. So, so we have had a bunch of questions piling up and uh, I, I'm so embarrassed that I neglected to say this at the very beginning. So Nancy is joining us. She and Matt Klaus and the National Cathedral's LGBTQIA congregation group are the reason that we are here tonight because they have uh, rose to your point about making sure that we are creating spaces in our churches. Um, Nancy and Matt and uh, Dana, our vicar and Patrick, our uh, associate have been working to support that particular um, collection and community and relationship building there. So Nancy, I don't know if there's more that you wanna say about that group and what they're doing either now or uh, um, before you get off, but I think it'd be really important for people to know about them. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'll still be here, but I'm gonna be quiet for a while. Great. Thanks, Michelle, so much. We do have some great questions and I'd actually like um, Allison, if she'd be willing to ask, her question, because I think that it picks up on some of the conversation that we've heard up to this point about um, how do we reach out and um, um, how do we work with that? So Allison, can you join us and ask your question, please? Sure, okay. Sorry, I'm gonna have to, I'm on two devices and that's causing a problem. Okay. Um, I was chatting on one and watching on another and there goes my hand. Um, so my question was, you know, our parish has a, has a booth at the pride festival every year. And we do a lot of trying to just kind of reach out and extend a hand and just say, you know, there is a church that welcomes you for people that, that haven't heard that. And, and there are folks that haven't. And and just kind of get that message across. And I feel like we're very good at saying, you know, well, here's what you thought those Bible verses meant, but here's what they really mean. And, you know, we can have conversations about Greek and all kinds of things like that. And we've got the intellectual down, um, but that doesn't work for everybody. And I feel like, you know, for, for people that have that, just that really kind of deep um, hurt and alienation and pain, and they've really been told in the church that they grew up in or in their parents' church or whatever, that they can't be Christian or that the, that the Bible is against them or whatever, I guess. So my question is, do, do you have any tips or, or thoughts for, um, for just reaching out in, in a way that touches that, you know, that, that kind of gives people a little more what they need to hear than just the, the academic arguments? 
I, I have a crazy idea um, um, as a way to start to build allies. Uh, and it's a little bit, uh, it, it sounds a little bit backwards. So uh, when I'm talking about L and G and B and T and I and A and queer and you know all of those letters, and I always joke about like, I didn't check the paper this morning, there may be a new one. And that always gets a laugh. And then I say, but that's awesome, right? Because what we're doing is discovering the um, diversity within our own community. And then I say to the audience, it's usually mostly straight, so what letters should we use about you? I mean, are you just like one big glob of heterosexuality? Uh, you're all just the, just the same, it's monolithic. What, what letters should we use about you? And what I'm trying to get at is we as a community have actually learned some stuff about talking about these issues, right? We've had, we've had to stay up late at night talking through these things just to survive. And we could actually help them talk about themselves. And once they begin to answer some of the questions we've had to answer, then we'll have much more common ground and we will understand uh, each other a lot more. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's any way to overstate the um, uh, importance of allies because still um, they can be in places where we are not yet welcome. And so um, I think there's a huge role to, to be played. But what I want to say to them is don't do this as charity work, you know, do this because it's a part of being human and you need to answer some of the same questions we've had to answer and you'll be a better person for it and, uh, and a better ally. Just a crazy idea. Rose, were you going to add something that looked like you had something to add? Okay, yes. Um... Right now, one of the, the great things that you're doing is you're, you're offering a ministry of presence. And there's something about, I mean, when, when we have um, the cathedral banner out there and we're walking in a pride parade, and those of us who are clergy have on our collars and for the cathedral, you know, we're saying all are welcome to our uses. Um, it's, it's, it's everybody. And the amount of response that we're able to get because there are people who are saying, the church, because we're referring that the church can love us, there's something about that presence and the invitation that you're making. And that's the important thing as you have conversations and you create these safe places where people can be vulnerable enough to share some of the pain and to also have a place of celebration of who they are and who we are. And so the ministry of presence is a huge thing. So don't discount that. Showing up is important. Showing up is important. And if I could, if I could quickly add, those are those are amazing answers. Um, you know, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I, I know that that it, it sounds like a bumper sticker, but what I mean by that is, you know, there there is a very strong current of anti-religious distrust uh, within the LGBTQ community, and for good reason. Um, there are countless, countless, uh, especially LGBTQ young people who have been abandoned again and again and again by the people who are supposed to love them, um, particularly those who wear cross around their necks. And so, you know, when they see someone from a church or uh, really from any place of worship uh, reach out to them, there's that sense of, if I let them inside, if I trust them, they're gonna abandon me once they find out who I really am. Um, and, and so, you know, showing up is incredible. People need to do it, but also know that, you know, you're going to encounter hostility and you have to get beyond that obstacle before you can really connect with one of these folks who have been hurt time and time again, and not to convert them or anything else like that. I know that's not our intention here, but just to let them know that I see your pain. I, I know you uh, have experienced so much trauma and just know that you can scream and chat at me. I'm still going to be here tomorrow to help. You're not gonna. You're not gonna scare me away uh, uh, by expressing the enormous amount of pain that you've experienced. Mm, thank you. There have been a number of questions about how can people act allies, straight, and and others. So I think that this has been helpful to try and identify it. And, um, 
Bishop Robinson, someone had referenced your book about that um, and that had seen it as particularly helpful for them. Do you have any points from that that you might want to add at this point? Um, I think, uh, I mean, thank you. Thanks for buying my book. Um, <laughs> the two cents that I, I made on that, I really appreciate, you know. Um, I, I think, well, let me start here. Um, when we, when we did the two services for Matthew Shepard, uh, and the burial of his ashes, uh, if you were there, you may remember that I said to the congregation, I know what courage it took some of you to walk in here this morning. I mean, it's like asking an abused, um, um, uh, abused wife to, to go back to her husband, right? Um, and for you to come back to the scene of so much pain for so many of us uh, is an act of courage on your part. I want you to know that I know that. And I also want you to know that this national cathedral is a safe place for you. And, and you might wanna check back with the church that you left because of how you were treated because they might have learned something since you left they might have actually changed too. So I, I, think, I think the more that we can be seen um, uh, being honest about uh, the relationship between uh, faith of whatever brand, uh, between faith and uh, our experience of sexuality, especially here in the United States, um, is, is really important. And I think LGBT people uh, uh, need need to say those of us, especially those of us who are still in the church, need to acknowledge uh, our complicity in all of that. And and you know, frankly, I think ninety percent of the of uh, the uh, discrimination that we experience is uh, is based in religion. And uh, I can remember talking to kids in my diocese in New Hampshire uh, who hadn't been in a Sunday school like since forever and uh, wouldn't have been able to find the book of Leviticus if their lives had depended on it. But they knew that God hated them. They knew that. It's, it's in the air and we've put it there. So it's our responsibility to clean that air up um, because it's, it's a deadly pollution. And so um, I don't know how that relates whatsoever to my book, but uh, what I know is that it's, we will uh, regain the trust of, of some of the people like Charlotte was talking about. We, we will regain some of that trust if, if we are honest about uh, what we have done, what we have learned, and what we want to do differently, and then uh, show it. Uh, and how we act. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So there um, have also been a number of questions about um, forgiving and, you know, people when you, you know, if we go to the name of the film, um, forgive them for they know not what they do. How do we forgive when someone knows exactly what they're doing? Um, and so that was that was a that's a question that comes up too because there may be churches there I believe many many churches are at the point that you talk about Bishop Jean but but what are um, some of the ways that can forgive folks even if they do know what they're doing and in the church? So I think I, I'm going to be very quick because I'm I don't want to hog this. It's it it just occurred to me for the first time ever in my 73 years that. Uh, Jesus didn't say he was forgiving them. He appeals to the Father to forgive them. And, and I think that there are some people in our lives that, um, you know what, maybe only God can forgive them because I'm not up, I'm not up to the task yet. Uh, so I, I think that there are ways of being hurt that badly that maybe sometimes you just have to leave it to God. Uh, because you don't need to keep putting up with that kind of abuse. 
I would I would totally agree that um, <clears throat> there's just some situations where I, I don't have it within me mm -hmm. to forgive. And it's all about God doing that. And for those situations where you have to look at the where you've been injured and how you've been injured. Um, sometimes, <clears throat> particularly with family members, their intent is really not the result. Mm -hmm. So they're intending from where they are to say, um, how can I help you through this? But they don't necessarily ask if this is going to work for you. They're, they're trying to do the best they can for your own good. And it's that for your own good piece that's, that's the genuine part of their hearts. But you have, we have to say, well, that's where they were. Can I forgive that? Can, can I forgive where they were and what happened and look at the transformation that may have happened since that and their ability to, to accept me as me? And so the forgiveness part, sometimes we can't, we've got to forgive because we can't walk around with that anger because that's just going to tear us up and it's not going to do anything to help us move forward. And I say that's, that, that kind of negative piece takes up God's faith in our lives and prevents us from fully being who God is calling us to do. And it's work. Forgiveness is work. <laughs> um, but sometimes we have to just, we have to step back and say, I'm able to do that. And then sometimes I have to leave it to God. I have to leave it to God and leave it in God's hands. Thank you. Definitely good food and strong food for thought and heart. Um, but I think I have one last question that's going to kind of tie in some of the culture and um, changes as well. And that is, um, you, you've all talked about the courage of this and the challenge with forgiveness in, in different ways. But in these times that we're, you know, that we're not only dealing with the LGBTQ community, but racial and other social justice, um, can you talk a little bit about where that courage comes from? Maybe it's from, you know, something that you've experienced in your faith, something, you know, that you call on when we're looking at changing culture and have the motivation then to change the, um, the, the laws and so forth, if that question makes sense. I'm actually gonna ask that this maybe be a closing offering from each of you. Right, that feels like Nancy, that's a lovely place for us to, to wrap. Where does the courage come from to stay in this? I, I would say that, um, you know what, I, I, I can't speak for everyone who's queer and everyone who's trans and whatnot, but I, I would say that the metaphor that always comes to mind when people ask about the courage bit is that it's like being in a burning building, you know, and a high rise when the room is on fire um, and you know you're going to die. Do you stay in there or do you jump out the window? Um, often for the queer experience or the trans experience, it's really about just surviving. I came out not because I think I had the courage to do so, I came out because I couldn't live another day being in the closet. So many trans children especially commit suicide in this country because they don't have any other way out. They don't have an environment where they can be themselves. They don't have a place where um, they can walk outside their front door and know that they're gonna be accepted in their authenticity. And so for them, the, alter the less painful alternative is to take their own life. Um, I know that's a dark thought, but I think it really speaks to courage not being so much as survival. And it's really important to honor that survival and, and ensuring that there's no space in this world where a person can't be their authentic, uh, authentic selves. Mm -hmm. For me, that, that uh, courage, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm, I'm courageous in, in any particular way but it's really rooted in the faith that I was raised in. Um, knowing that I have a God who loved me enough to send Jesus, who knows everything about me and who knows me and who knows every emotion 
that I could ever have. And to be able to rest in that, um, even when I feel there are times that the, the, the church will do things that hurt me, I lean on Jesus. That, that's where it is. It's, it's my faith in that. And that's not going to go anywhere. That has remained steady. It's remained steady throughout. And it's something that I trust and it's something that I lean on and I'm sure about. Now, that's just for me. But that's something that gives me the, the energy to stand and to wake up every day and to take on the world when it may look at me, whether it's looking at me as... Um, a black woman or a lesbian does it. God is there. And that faith holds me so steady. And that's what that I'm so grateful for each and every day. I think it was um, um, Sarah McBride's uh, father who said towards the end of the film, um, if we could all just have a little bit more courage, right? I think sometimes we think, uh, courage means you you're doing something ginormous uh, when it 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 may be more helpful to do lots of little little courageous things right I have a I have a, a little card on my uh, wall by my desk uh, and it says uh, courage is fear that has said its prayers so I think Courage comes from uh, acknowledging the fear and not letting it stop you. For me, where that comes from is, so um, you know, uh, several times a day, I remind myself that, um, uh, that I'm loved by God and nobody can take that away from me, like nobody. And uh, because I know that, I sometimes am able to do uh, amazing things because even if it goes horribly, God's love is not, uh, it's not dependent on that. Um, if I do something great, God loves me. If I do something awful, God still loves me. So why not use that, right? I, I will remember like yesterday that just before my consecration, I, I felt God so close that I, I slept for an hour just before the consecration. I get up and I'm putting on my bulletproof vest um, beneath my vestments and my daughters are looking really unglued. And I had the opportunity to explain to them that the, the reward for being Christian is that even if death happens, it's not the end. Like I said to them, I don't want to be a martyr and I don't want to come out of this dead. But if that were to happen, you need to know that I'm just fine. I just think we need to like from time to time, um, use our, I mean, the, our faith is meant to equip us to do things. And I think we underestimate it. And if we really do believe that nothing, as, as um, I think it was Rose said, nothing can separate us from the love of God, then that ought to, that ought to make us remarkably powerful and courageous. Maybe it's just to speak up in a meeting where nobody's standing up for the little person or the, the marginalized person, or I mean, a, a thousand different ways. That's have to be a big thing, but, but don't undersell the faith that you have. Let it uh, work inside you. So, um, let your fear say its prayers and then get to work. Wow. Thank you, all three of you. And we've got a couple more brief things. Nancy, do you want to say a little bit about the Alliance at the Cathedral so folks can connect with you all? Certainly. We are a, a group at the Cathedral that does programs like this that does um, we have been 
um, having social events and formation and um, celebrate who we are. And um, if you have registered for this, we will be in touch with you because we will use this registration um, to call to reach out. And some of these are folks that regularly attend the, the cathedral and some of the folks are um, people that worship in other locations, but because they saw our banner come and spend time, whether it's um, book studies or whether it is um, just great fellowship. So we get together quarterly or we used to get together quarterly for social hours. <laughs> um, and we will again, God willing, and I trust that completely. But please do, you know, and let us know um, what you might be interested in um, as well, um, because we are very blessed to have people um, that um, we know love us and where our faith is uh, strong. So please uh, know that if you've registered, you'll get it. And if you haven't registered, please put it in the comp, your, um, how to contact you in some way, or you can reach out to us at LGBTQI, LGBTQIA at cathedral.org. And we have an email address and I monitor that. So <laughs> I will welcome you with open arms and open heart. Oh, and it is a gift to be welcomed by Nancy. Let me tell you all, you do not want to miss that opportunity. You do not want to miss it. So Nancy, thank you. Thank you for everything that you all are doing. And, it, and just to sort of wrap up that, that note, sometimes we need each other to have our faith be stronger, right? Sometimes that courage comes from the connection. And so even if you don't think you need it, Sometimes we need it, right? So show up, right? Figure out where to get connected and where to get support. I'm going to ask Bishop Jean to wrap us up with a final prayer. We've we've had some glorious sermons from all of you. <laughs> it has been tremendous. So I want to. I just we've talked a lot about how difficult it can be to come out. We've named some of that. We've named some of the fear, and. I just am so grateful that I am looking at four beautiful people who have taken those steps, right? Who have, whether it's for survival, whether it's because you had no other choice, whether you did it alone, whether you did it with your church or your family or a community of people around you, I'm so grateful to be part of a circle of people who've taken that journey to be your full and thriving and amazing selves. Um, Cause it doesn't come easy. Everybody, no matter whether you're straight or whether you're part of the, the alphabet soup, right? We all have a journey. And for some of us, this particular part of our journey is, is tender. And it's the thing that helps us say, oh, I did it. I'm on the path, I'm on the journey. And it, it is a delight to know anybody who has taken that journey in the face of risk. And, and folks in this community are often those people and are beautiful for it. So I'm grateful to be here with you all. And uh, Bishop, if you would pray us out, we'd be grateful. I would be delighted. Good and gracious God, fill us with thanksgiving for how wonderfully you have made us, each marvelously different, yet all made in your image. Calm the fears we so often have of those different from ourselves open our eyes to see that we have far more in common than that which separates us. Give us courage to stand as you always did with the oppressed. Let us be the voices that speak and the lives that show forth your love and especially help us to communicate your love to those who have been told that you condemn them. And finally, bring us all to that place where pain and discrimination are no more, but only your light and your peace, resting in your arms forevermore. Amen. Amen. Good night. Be safe. Be well. Be connected. And we'll catch you next time. Panelists, if you want to hang around for a few minutes, we'd love to touch base with you afterwards.